We can see the decline in what has been become a twilight economy, an economy that is neither surging nor collapsing. Its growth, its productivity, its world position steadily, inexorably slowing, delivering a sluggish standard of living to our middle class and hopelessness to our poor. Oh, there's economic bounty, no doubt, in America, but it's unevenly spread. It subtly divides this country by region, by class, and by group. But the prosperity of one America cannot hide the traumas of the other Americas. For one out of every three children born in America today is born into poverty, and whole generations are trapped in our inner cities, wasting away day by day without hope. And our relations with the rest of the world are in chaos. Our politics and our foreign policy oscillates wildly from accommodation to aggressiveness. And nowhere is that failure more evident than in our foreign policy with regard to Nicaragua, where the president seems determined not to mention crazed. The president seems determined, despite all history, all logic, and all common sense, to do what was told in my generation, to destroy Nicaragua in order to save it. And in the Middle East, we sacrifice hundreds of, hundreds of Marines to terrorist violence. And then, while promising the swift sword of justice, we instead clandestinely deliver arms to those who mastermind their death. And instead, and instead of dealing with these difficult and soluble problems, our leaders in both parties, spurred on by the media, move from mantra to mantra, chanting competitiveness in this season, drug abuse in the last political season, deficit reduction in the season before, and industrial policy in yet, in yet another season, all the while seeking to soothe the fickle beast of public opinion. And for much too long, we have sacrificed personal excellence and community values for the mere accumulation of material things. Our brightest graduate students seek quick riches as investment bankers rather than producers of real wealth. And our economic managers pursue quarterly paper profits at the expense of long-term productive investment. And while Japan produces tens of thousands of engineers to manage the technologies of the future, we produce legions of lawyers who engineer only takeovers and leverage buyouts. And for a decade, for a decade led by Ronald Reagan, self-aggrandizement has been the full-throated cry of our society. I've got mine, so go get yours. Or what's in it for me? The bottom line, that's what Ronald Reagan has told this country, is the measure of our worth. But the bottom line tells us everything about our lives except that which makes them worth living. It tells them everything about our country, except that which makes us proud to be Americans. And ladies and gentlemen, something's gone wrong in America. When Ivan Boski, before his fall, could stand at this graduation ceremony of one of the great institutions in this country and say, and I quote, Greed is good and get an ovation. Something's wrong, and it's up to we Democrats to change it. America stands at a crossroads, and the question is whether we'll continue to allow ourselves to be held hostage to the politics of the moment, continuing to drift in the still waters of the present or whether we'll make up our minds as a nation to ascend the rapids of history and reach for greatness once again. The choice, the 
choices we have to make are inescapable, either by our conscious decision or by our indecision. We'll make fundamental changes in our foreign policy, our agricultural policy, our nuclear policy, and civil rights in the next four years. And on the next president's term, the future of this nation will in large part rest. The next president of the United States will determine whether or not we nuclearize the heavens with Star Wars or we have the most significant arms control agreement in the history of mankind. The next president, the next president of the United States, whether it's Michael Dukakis or Joe Biden or anyone else in here, the next president of the United States will determine whether man, the scientist, or man, the negotiator, will prevail. And it must be man, the negotiator. The same can be said about our educational system, which is in decay, the radical changes that are needed to bring it back, about our trade policy, and about our policy as to how we treat one another in this society. I'm not satisfied that more than half of all those new jobs that we're told have been created are service economy jobs that pay less than $7,000 a year. And ladies and gentlemen, that's the unspoken price of this service economy we seem to herald. Come with me. Come with me to my steel mills and ask that woman or man who loses a job paying $17 and 50 cents an hour making a steel girder, whether or not they think they have a job making 350, making hamburgers. That's the price it's paid. And in order to achieve the great goals that we must, there are many things we must expect our government to do. We must have an economy driven by a technological supremacy a vigorous economy for the information age that stamps on that age made in America. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, there's much more to say, but I don't want to trespass on my time, except to suggest that beyond, beyond this nation and this party coming up with specific prescriptions about how we have to do things, we must have a government that understands that government can have more done for it outside of government. Government can do many things, but in the final analysis, government can act little more than as a catalyst. We must demand more of ourselves, for nothing will suffice short of the wholesale commitment of an entire society. Our managers, our workers, our consumers are needed to change their attitudes in order to revitalize this society. And the central issue, the central question, the central social as well as economic challenge of our time is whether or not we will reclaim the tradition of community, whether we can maximize our potential as a community and not just as individuals. We also need a new political leadership, a leadership that recognizes that its role is not just to preside over our government, but to lead society. We need a leadership prepared to go to the American people and tell them not only what it promises them, but tell them what it's going to demand of them as well. And above all, and above all, we need a new kind of presidential leadership. A presidential leadership that's prepared to tell the hard truths and lead this country. Ladies and gentlemen, I, like many of you in this room, share the distinction of being part of that so-called baby boom generation. I, like many of you in this country, are part of that generation that is the largest in our history. And in our youth, we changed America. We changed America not merely by our votes, but by our ideas as well as our ideals. 
When we marched, we did not march with a 14-point program. We marched to change attitudes. And ladies and gentlemen, whether or not it was civil rights, the women's movement, preserving the environment or ending the war in Vietnam, in our youth, we profoundly altered the face of this country. And now, and now in the season of our maturity, fate has delivered us to a special moment. For a second time, our generation has a unique chance to redeem the character and the future of America. In 1988, more than half the voters will come from this generation. And 1988 has woven into its fabric an important coincidence. For 1988 will not only be a year about the future, it will also be a year of anniversary and remembrance. 1988 marks the 25th anniversary of the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And so, for us, 1988 will be a special year, a closing of the circle as our past meets our future. You know, affixed to a balcony in Memphis, Tennessee, is a plaque. And it reads, Behold, here cometh the dreamer. Let us slay him and see what becomes of his dreams. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the cynics believe that my generation has forgotten. They believe that the ideals and compassion and conviction and courage to change the world that marked our youth are now nothing but a long, faded wisp of our adolescence. They believe that having reached the conservative age of mortgage payments, pediatricians' bills, and concern for our children's welfare, that we have forgotten who we are and what we believe. But I'm here to tell you, they have misjudged us. For I can still, I can still hear those dreamers and so can you. Let the word go forth from this time and place that the torch has been passed, passed to a new generation of Americans. Or some men see things as they are and say why. Others see the dream things that never were and say why not. Or Martin Luther King saying, I have a dream that someday and so forth. Ladies and gentlemen, just because they murdered our heroes does not mean that the dream does not still live buried deep in the broken hearts of tens of millions of Americans. I remember those dreamers and so do you. They made me feel good about myself. They made me feel good about my country. And most of all, they made me feel proud of my country. It was a soaring sensation. And I remember it every time I hear that hymn in my church based on the 91st Psalm. And it goes like this. It says, and he will raise you up on eagle's wings and bear you on the breath of dawn and make the sun to shine on you. Well, that's how I felt. That's the natural feeling for an American. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to restore America's soul. It's time to be on the march again. It's time to get America moving again. Come join me and let's move it. Thank you very much.